the Sanctuary of Light and the Light Institute welcome each and all of you to this time of knowings and invite you to bring forward the questions of your hearts so that our conversations can ripple out into the world. So please, let's begin. I had a question about how you process sadness for things that are sometimes inevitable. And what's a good way to do that? Especially when it um, affects you sometimes in places in your heart you didn't know that it was going to? Yes. Always sadness is a part of our relationship from the human perspective. And what's important is to look at our lives and the people in our lives and the, and the things that happen to us from a spiritual perspective. Not trying to disengage your look intellectually from a lofty position, but from an expanded perception that allows you to see that there is purpose in all that we experience. And we, we might say, oh, it doesn't have to be that way, or, or I don't want to see somebody hurt. I, but we cannot know how their soul uses the energy because we think of ourselves only as humans with human emotional hearts. We are so much, so much more. My higher self has always said uh, to expand your energy. Uh, if there's a sadness in your heart, uh, move into it. Don't deny it. Move into it and see what it's about. In the same way that when people die, our sorrow is usually about us. We're the ones with the hole. The rest of the guys are free. You know? And so we, we want to be able to see what the story is for us that's creating the sadness. Sadness is very addictive uh, because it lulls us into a place of non-motion. You know? Um, and so, again, sadness has its place as it identifies um, our relationship, our relationship to love, to health, to uh, the world around us. Uh, but again, the sadness comes because we don't see the purpose. We don't see that um, there is nothing supporting um, hurt uh, or pain. Uh, it's, there's, there is no great being inviting that. God is not saying you need to be punished, you need to suffer. Uh, and so we want to begin to shed from us the layers that <coughs> lock us into those perceptions. Because if you remove the sadness, you can find a layer of illumination. And through that layer of illumination, you can take yourself out of the sadness and also whomever else is uh, tied into that sadness <coughs> yourself. Um, it's, it's just like pain or, or anything. How we focus on it describes how long it lasts and its effect on us. And so we want to focus on it not from a place of running away, but from a place of clarity. It says this is what this is. And then, when, when you've looked at those places that are hiding in your heart, I would recommend washing the heart. You know, the heart muscle is surrounded by a liquid-filled sac called the perineal sac. Not the perineal sac. <laughs> the pericardium sac. <laughs> perineum is down here. The pericardium <laughs> sac. <laughs> Just like a baby in the womb. That's why I'm thinking of that baby in the womb that cushions the heart from the bruises of life. So when you feel a sorrow deep, deep in your heart that, that comes up and surprises you, um, after you meditate on it or, or uh, ask it what color it needs to be released or shift your energy from sadness to where am I holding courage or illumination or joy so that you rebalance that, then just imagine, and we'll do this exercise right now because it's, it's important for physiological health, it's important for emotional health. Um, in Chinese medicine, we call it the emotional heart, the pericardium. And we can actually drain those fluids 
which become very polluted as we go through life. Every time the, the arrows of, uh, of life strike you, it creates a poisoning in those liquids. And we can drain that away and put fresh, protective, nourishing liquids into the pericardial area uh, to support who you are. So close your eyes, take a deep breath into your body, and bring your consciousness into your heart and imagine it sitting in a sack of fluid, protective fluid, cushioning fluid, and just take a look at your pericardial fluid. Does it look rusty, rust color? Does it look opaque? Does it have flex in it? Um, is it heavy like gel? Just let your heart show you that pericardial fluid at this moment. And then take a deep breath into your body. And just imagine that you are pouring that water out and that your pericardium is showing you how to replace that water. Perhaps you see your heart in the sea or in a lake or under a waterfall or in a shower. Just take a deep breath and let your body give you an image of replacing those liquids, those fluids. <coughs> so that you're washing the heart and then you're feeling that pericardial sac with fresh, clear life force energy. Just breathe deeply in. Wash your heart. Fill the sac. Take a deep breath and just open your eyes. What we don't know about ourselves is that we have the strength to use every hurt, every impossible experience in such a way that it creates the evolution of the soul. That we do go on, we go on from the sorrows, we go on from the hurts. So it's very important to connect in to that energy in you that is not that. That is not that. If, if the sorrow is because someone else is hurting or someone else is sick or someone else is left, I'm, you don't, you're not really helping them. You're not helping them. And that's okay. But <clears throat> if we allow sadness to take hold, it becomes uh, like a heavy incrustation. And then we pass our life through that, that heaviness. And we associate through that. And then we expect the hurt again and again and again. The best that we can give this world at this time is a sense of joy, a sense of change, a sense of possibility, that there is no scar uh, that needs to last a lifetime. Why do people that have heart disease seem to have that deep sadness? Mm, they're definitely related, mm -hmm. you know, because as the Chinese would say, the heart is not just uh, a pump, a physiological pump. There is an emotional heart. It has emotional aspects. And so when we um, are constricted, when we constrict our hearts uh, through hurt, through anger, through helplessness, um, we create a looping of energy that repeats itself, a kind of a groove. And uh, those kinds of grooves eh, damage us, they damage us. That's why uh, some of the great alternative healers will always talk about, uh, get a good movie and laugh. You know, that that is a great healing. Uh, because 
Physiologically, if you're laughing, you cannot hold your heart tight. One of the things that I learned in my last death experience is that we do all squeeze our hearts. We squeeze our hearts when we're afraid. We squeeze our hearts when we're angry. Uh, we squeeze our hearts. If you squeeze your heart, eventually you will create blood clots. You will create um, uh, interference, uh, and the heart will not be able to function. And so then comes a series of uh, situations, physiological situations, that disturb the heart and eventually take you from your body. Uh, so it's very important to pay attention to your heart. So it's like a catch-22. It's a catch-22. And the catch is that uh, if you live from a place of hurt in your heart, your heart will express that back to you. And it will be expressed in something like a heart attack, um, angina pain, uh, stroke, etc. And so, uh, again, it serves no one for your, for your body to be damaged. So we want to uh, pay attention to our heart uh, and, and to really listen to the heart. Uh, Again, we, we don't even notice that it's beating unless you're afraid and suddenly it beats very fast or you have arrhythmia and it beats in a, uh, strange rhythms. We don't even notice that our heart is beating. So it's really important uh, in a meditation or in a, a moment of checking in on yourselves to listen to your heart. What does it sound like? What's the vibration of it? You know? uh, so that you are communing with your heart. In all of my books, I talk about how important it is to commune with your body, to let your body tell you. Your, your heart will tell you what that deep sorrow is, what that deep sadness is. It'll take you right back to the beginning. And you might be surprised that that sadness isn't even yours. You may have made a contract with your mother or your father or your grandparent, when you were in the womb, when you were a month old, that said, I will take the burden of your sorrow. And it sits in there until you grow older, and then it cannot be held in your heart any longer. So whenever there's something, uh, a, a sadness or a pain, or something odd that's going on in our emotional body or our physical body, I always recommend saying, is, is this mine? And you will be shocked at how many times it is not yours. Therefore, you can use the awareness to be part of your purpose. To whom does this belong? Even if you don't get the name or it's not somebody you know, the moment that you can identify it's not yours, you can begin to draw cosmic energies through you to support whoever is suffering from that. Again, whether it's a physiological thing, it's an emotional thing, it's a spiritual thing, it's a mental thing. And it allows you to lift up. Because we all come with one hinge uh, that opens the door of, of evolution. And, and that is the purpose of giving the self. What else? I wonder if you might speak to what uh, <clears throat> you could share that you see uh, coming into manifestation for 2012. I had I just finished doing the windows. Uh, Amy and I did an exchange of windows recently, and windows are uh, one of the highest octaves of work that we do at the Light Institute. It doesn't mean it's the end, but it takes you uh, up into the higher octaves, the higher chakra areas which allow you um, the clarity of illumination. And I saw something very interesting as I was doing that, that first of all, I'm always reiterating to the world, give up on the Mayans. They didn't do very well. <laughs> they didn't do very well. As soon as the Galactics gave them a few little crumbs, and they said the Galactics were the gods, and they had to please them, and they started cutting out hearts, they really lost the illumination. 
they lost the capacity to uh, use this great advancement of humanity that was offered to them. Uh, whether that was because the Mayans were connected to groups of uh, galactic beings who were technologically advanced but not emotionally advanced, this is a possibility as well. But they didn't do that. <coughs> so that line that says this is the end, it can mean many things. It can mean the end of the cycle that had to do with cycle uh, in terms of the realities of the Mayans, in terms of the galactic beings who have influenced the planet at this time. Maybe it's a going of one group and a coming of another. Uh, I definitely feel that what's going to happen in 2012 is happening now um, and will happen past 2012 is a ripple of consciousness that's coming from other realities, from other Earths, quote unquote, that will support our catapultic leap in consciousness. So what I saw in, in a session that I did was a sort of a curvature whereby by releasing some galactic energy from inside the earth, the earth tilted and as some old energy was released, new energy came in. And uh, we're going to have at the end of February our first intensive here in Galisteo. And after my window sessions I decided that the theme of that intensive is going to be freedom. Freedom on all levels of our beings, freedom from our bodies, freedom from our relations, freedom from our uh, finances, freedom uh, as humans, freedom in all of the ramifications because that's what we need to make that catapultic leap and it's not going to be from a flat closure, this is the end to a beginning because endings and beginnings never are never like that. They are always a bleeding in and a bleeding out anyway. They are always an infolding in the same way that our universe infolds in other universes. And so, uh, what I would say in 2012 is it's, it's a time that is very important for us to, as my higher self says, dream ourselves awake. Which means to have time to go inside and to call to us energies that our higher self can bring to us that illuminate the direction uh, of our choices. And so it's an exciting time, but it's not the end or the beginning or anything like that. Uh, it will go on. Will there be earthquakes or this or that? Well, yes. Haven't there been in the last few years? You know, they started talking about the, the time of uh, the Aquarius uh, epic quite a while ago. Uh, all of those things are there. It's not whether we can avoid, and this is a great message, a great teaching that my higher self has given me in terms of life. It is not about avoiding the uh, blockages or the stepping stones or the experiences. It's about the grace with which you embrace them. And so what will happen in 2012? All the things that have been happening in 2011, but better. Uh, 2012 is a five year, not a four year. So I think there'll be actually less struggle, more freedom, especially if we put our consciousness to that, you know, and invite in energies that will support us at uh, being able to contribute. And the most powerful way of contributing, certainly at this moment, is not in the doing, it's what is held in the consciousness. And if we are capable of holding this incredible turning point, it's going to be an exciting year because uh, there are energies that are awaiting us. Some of them are in the deviate kingdom. Some of them come from animals. Some of them come from the stars. Some of them come uh, from other uh, stratification, other realities whether you want to call those other worlds or other realities, they are waiting for us to pull away the veil. It is not difficult to pull away the veil. It simply asks you to focus on that veil and be willing to pull it aside. So I think it's going to be uh, 
a great um, peeping through the windows possibility in this next year, only as a beginning. I think more things will happen in 2013, 2014 than actually in 2012. Uh, but it's a wonderful time uh, for us to say, what do we want it to be? What do we want to be as a species? What do we want to be as individuals? Um, what whispers to us that has to do with our purpose? Uh, so, I, I think it's important to put our energies away from resisting and, and contracting. Because if you contract, uh, you will be a magnet to all the things you're afraid of. And this is why it's such an important year for freedom and for releasing our fears. And to feel what it's like to pass through the illusion of death, for example. <laughs> What else? Yes. I was wondering if you could talk about communicating with your higher self. Yes. The first thing that I want to say is that all of the history that we have has said we haven't the right to whisper to ourselves of our own divinity. As if to talk to God or to talk to a wiser being, that there is always a struggle. That you, have to, you have to forfeit something to be worthy. And all of that has to do with the human evolution. Uh, those are all thought forms that humans have created to, to basically have control over each other. Your higher self is the energy of your soul that accompanies you in body. So it's always talking to you anyway. It talks to you in your dreams. It talks to you in your intuition. It talks to you when you go, mm, I think this. You know? But when you begin to say higher self, this way or that way, when you begin to actually call it in, uh, you will feel that you, um, that there is an answer. The higher self doesn't necessarily answer you in sentences. <laughs> yes, do that. <laughs> it may answer you and suddenly you open a book and, and there is a point of illumination. Or you're listening to a movie and suddenly somebody says something in the movie that triggers a point of association for you. What's important is to allow and seek communication with your higher self. When, when you go to bed at night, especially, and when you get up in the morning, higher self, touch my body. Higher self, what color do I need right now? Higher self, come into my body. Uh, doing those kinds of things will suddenly allow you to begin to feel as if there is that energy in you always. You are your higher self because you are a divine soul being. You are not only a human. This is only one of the garments that you wear. So uh, I, for example, will say to my higher self, mm, Shall I watch television? Oh, I don't watch television, but shall I watch a movie? Uh, shall I wear this thing or that thing? Shall I eat now? Uh, I ask my higher self the most mundane questions because it allows that stream of focus to be there, that sense of, yes, this is it. One of the things that I will say about asking your higher self is if your higher self says, yes, do this, do it. Uh, initially, I used to often try to out second guess my higher self uh, because it so often will give you the hardest answer. You know, face up to the to whatever has to be faced up to, or or go in this direction. And I would say, no, 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 but that's going to be a lot harder. And what I found is, if you will actually surrender to your own higher self, and one of the ways that I describe it when I'm doing consultations is the intuitive essence of your soul. So when you surrender to your own intuitive essence, then what happens is, uh, in ways you couldn't have imagined, things work out differently. And then you find yourself saying, so glad I did that, instead of the other. You know, so it's very important. If you say, oh, hire yourself, shall I do this? Do it. 
no matter what. No matter what. So what we want to do is to shake away from waiting for the thunder claps, you know, of the higher self. Your higher self might come as a deer or a flower or a, a mathematical design or something. We don't have to understand it, but the more that you ask it to take form, the more it helps the energy of the body to align to it. Because the body's energetic, and so it wants to uh, be able to touch with your senses uh, something. And that's why, what form does it take? And then use whatever form it takes uh, to align you. Sometimes it'll give you a form that represents a point of association in a lifetime that you've had or an experience of the soul that you don't really recognize, but somehow it belongs to you. And when it's doing that, it's opening your consciousness to allow energies to come in that will support you. So the higher self is our, our dearest, dearest, dearest friend and uh, uh, guide. There are no guides. Uh, angels or otherwise that uh, are anywhere near in the same league as your own voice, your own inner voice, your own higher self. Some people say, well, how will I know the difference between my higher self and my emotional body? The emotional body will always try to get you to do the easiest thing. It will always try to make sure you're going to win the argument. You're going to win whatever it is you're seeking. The, the higher self will just cut to the chase. So if you feel this slippery, seductive, yeah, do that over there, that's probably your emotional body. But the more that you connect with your higher self, the easier it will be for you to feel that you can trust your intuition, trust uh, what seems true to you. Will you please talk about Botox? Botox? <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Botox. That which is so poisonous <laughs> that it can freeze your muscles. Mm -hmm. I, I can't just talk about Botox. I well, have to talk yeah. about the purpose of Botox. Yeah. Because that's what has more meaning for everyone. Uh, uh, science has discovered that they can use this very poisonous toxin to... Uh, tranquilize, let's say, or numb uh, the muscles that, that contract, that cause wrinkles and cause uh, energies and to change the way we look. As is so true, we often don't know what the end result of that will be for 20 more years. And so what I would say is look first to the purpose of it. Uh, we honor youth. Uh, we want to look fresh and powerful, men and women, and so we use whatever we can get our hands on to uh, create that mask or that illusion. Uh, and because of that, I would say, always ask your body if it could tolerate or would like that, that particular technique. Because there are many new techniques coming onto the scene right now. More important than what you put on your face or stick in your face is uh, the way you feel about your face. Uh, in the same way that in Avalon, in the myths of Avalon, they talked about how they could change and, and give the impression of being a, a virgin, a young maiden. All of that is capable. We are all capable of that. We want to look at where is the hurt or the sadness or the fear that's inside us that brings us to that point, shall I use Botox? I would say that anything, anything that makes you feel uh, powerful, desired, uh, willing to be visible, uh, is okay for you. It's okay for you. Uh, but I would always suggest that you uh, do consultations at the Light Institute or do, or do sessions at the Light Institute so that you really can align with your body. 
But in that way, whatever you do will become much more successful. Much less uh, possibility of disasters uh, when you are attuning to your own body. And then anybody who is doing anything to your body to always send light to them. Always send energy to them so that they are not thinking about their own world, but they are totally focused on the perfection of their art. And people, when they go to a doctor, whatever kind of doctor or healer, they, they always want to give up the self and let the other person do it. No, you have to actually guide the other person so that the other person does it well for you and can pay attention to you. That's very, very crucial in this whole dance. So, um, I think that uh, in the near future they'll come up with better things than Botox. <laughs> um, we all need to feel better about ourselves. We all need to release the primordial conclusions that if you age, you will no longer be desired, that you will not have a place, that you will not be chosen, and, and your conclusions about what that means. Who needs to choose you is you. And once we choose ourselves, then we seem radiant and magnificent to others, no matter what's going on in our faces or our bodies. And so I would always say, do a little homework, and that homework is not just about what kind of poison is this. It's about um, what's my story? What is my story here? And how do I, how do I work with my body to bring it uh, into that alignment that makes me feel secure? So the thing is, it's so poisonous. <clears throat> Your liver has to process that, that out, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Our liver has to process everything. That's why it's so important to do liver flushes and uh, protect and strengthen our livers. There's so many ways to do it. Things to take that support your liver. Manual uh, manipulation, as I'm doing right now. Just a, passing over your liver to move it so that it can stringe itself and and be awakened so that it can process uh, any kinds of poisons. It's also important to discuss the fact that emotional and mental poisons are absolutely as strong as physical ones. Our liver is the organ of purification, emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, on all levels. So, uh, it is the most important organ of the body. The body cannot survive without the liver. That's why the liver, of all the organs, can most quickly and easily rejuvenate itself, because the body can't survive without it. So yes, the liver has to uh, detoxify whatever you put in, whether that's Coca-Cola in a can, or Botox, or um, vengeance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, we all know that word, don't we? I love that word in Spanish. In Spanish, venganza. Venganza has a lot of power. <laughs> Could you speak about the importance or lack thereof, of physical place, being in a certain place. The primordial body, the primordial body is that element, that aspect of us that whose whole function is to make sure that we survive. Uh, would always like a place of safety. Ultimately, if we have a consciousness that includes all elements uh, of our beingness, the place becomes less important. But uh, in this world today, having a place that to call home is very supportive so that we can be as calm as possible uh, 
so that we have a sanctuary because uh, we all feel the, the brunt of the external life that goes on. Now, you can make that place anywhere. You could make that place in your car. Uh, you could make that place in any rented whatever. It's uh, how you, and, and here's what I would say that I think is very important. Whatever place that you have where you go to bed at night, you have the power, has nothing to do with money, to instill in that place an energy that is, makes it your sanctuary, that protects you, uh, that nourishes you. And so you want to have that consciousness. You want to have only beautiful things around you. You do not want to carry uh, all of the burdens of your life with you, all the little points of reference. Um, I, I'm always amazed at how much stuff we uh, put into our, our homes, our place, our physical place, uh, so that we can feel safe. And we're doing that because the, the primordial body is saying, well, if I remember this, then that I'll know who I am. And so therefore, I'm okay because I know who I am. Instead of, who am I becoming at this moment? What is beautiful to you today that you may never have noticed 20 years ago? And so I think every year at the beginning of the year is a great time to go through your stuff. Shifted around, I just took all my crystals out and washed them, you know, uh, and throw away old photographs, um, uh, buy new sheets, salt your room, uh, look around and say, what are the colors that I love right now? What uplifts me? What's the sound that I need? What do I want to cast my eyes on? What do I want to touch? Uh, that will make me feel uh, embraced. And you could do that anywhere. I think that uh, moving your stuff around is very important. You know, we, we put that picture there and we leave it there. <laughs> Just like we do our toothbrush forever and ever and ever. <laughs> it needs to be moved around. Uh, what was essential to you that needed to be by your bedstead uh, last year probably is not, if you were being conscious or evolving, what you need next to your bedstead today. And so uh, we, we want to feel that the protection and the safety and the comfort is inside us. And that's why meditation is so important. You know, if you could close your eyes... What would be the scene inside you that would make you feel safe and yet at the same time expanded? It probably wouldn't be your bedroom. It would, or anything that you have in your house, you know, even an artistic painting. It would probably be uh, some picture of nature, some, some memory of walking in the woods or by the sea or the desert or something. I, and so we need to allow those energies to take up space inside our inner vision, our inner, all of our inner senses, because that's what makes us safe. And you can't carry your house with you. You must go outside your house, walk in the streets, drive in your car, uh, interface with other people. And so uh, this is something that a two-year-old must learn. You know, they can leave the mother and run out but they always want to run back. But they have to have that time of being out. You can't carry your mother with you. You can't carry uh, the protection or those things that represent that protection with you. It has to be something that comes from inside you. That's why the higher self is so important. You know, that sense. And to carry that, to, to, to listen uh, to that energy and carry that out creates a ripple in your auric field that makes everyone else feel safe about you, around you. And that's, again, part of the purpose of our life is to give that gift to others and to so many people who today are losing their homes or are in emotional turmoil one way or another to, to somehow connect with their deepest energy to tell them, you're fine. You're fine. This is all stuff. 
And we came here for this. We came here to shift and to change uh, thousands of years of patternings that no longer serve humanity. So, again, whatever you call home, whether you're moving to it or from it, uh, look around at it and see if it's really you. Uh, because probably 80% of what's in your home isn't really you. It's just what, it's just the crutch. That you said, ah, as long as I can look at that, I'll know who I am. Well, who you are is beyond, <laughs> beyond all those things. Who you are is changing every day. It's only the soul energy that pulses from a point of stillness in the cosmos. You know, many years ago, you were giving a talk to a, a group of... Uh, uh, elderly people from the, the home in um, Las Cruces. Yes. And you you just made the most brilliant statement. Like it, you said to them, you are your own safe haven. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, it was, Chris. Thank you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you are your own safe haven. And you really are. And I worked with street kids in Bolivia, uh, you know, Bolivia and, and uh, Brazil, well, in several different countries. And that's something that I learned from them. Those that have learned to steal or to protect themselves from the time they're small children, uh, they look out at you and they see whether you are a safe haven or not. They see if you are afraid, uh, uh, if you are open, if you feel that the world is dangerous. And that's how they choose their victims. And so we really want to carry an energy with us that says, I'm safe. Not only am I safe, but you're safe with me. Because the world needs that echo. Safe havens. They are everywhere. Nine billion strong. What else? Can you talk about collective consciousness and how we might... Um, began to evolve into that or tap into that? You know, I, I feel that we've had a very negative perspective in terms of collective consciousness. We use the word, uh, and if you say it, immediately we think about you know, advanced beings melting, melding their consciousness. But for ourselves, since we're so afraid of each other, uh, we would be terrified that someone would hear our thoughts uh, and being a child who could hear people's thoughts when I was little, uh, I was very aware of how secretive people are and how negative they are. And uh, so in order to step to that level of collective consciousness, we have to clear away a lot of our fears. Uh, fear of being discovered, fear of our secrets, fear of other people's power. There's a lot of cleaning up to do before we could really have collective consciousness. Collective consciousness allows for a melding in which the periphery, the edges of where you end and I begin, uh, start to melt away. That's why uh, I've talked about several of my books, a Cosmic Orgasm. Uh, or even higher octaves of sexual connection, where you can't tell who, who is one person and who is another. That's one of the ways to begin on those levels, because sexuality is the closest energy to spirit. It's how we get into body. So in order for us to use collective consciousness to see which way to go, how to resolve uh, our issues as a species, as a planet, uh, we have to be able to meld. And again, it's the catch-22 of individuation. When the soul breaks free and comes chooses to come into body, there's an individuation process that goes on throughout your life and actuality. And, and uh, for us, it is, it is wrought with negativity and fear. Uh, because, again, as I was talking about in terms of the safety of the home, we feel that if we don't identify our individuality, that we would cease to exist. But 
we will not. Uh, the more that we can collectively come together, the more expanded and, and powerful we are. It's something we're learning on the planet right now that we've been learning for the last 20 years or so, there's power in groups. If you want to change something politically, if you want to change something, just gather together in a group so that you have a group voice. And it, and it begins to uh, vibrate and, and shake the ground, so to speak. So um, we need to learn how to be an individual and at the same time meld. To do that, we, ha we need to come to an octave that allows us to, uh, to really discover uh, what the self is. The self is not individuation the way we've perceived it. We are all melded together, we just don't realize it. Our auric feels blur. Um, you feel pain that somebody else is carrying. We're much more uh, merged than, uh, than we think we are. If we could release our fear of that so that you could begin to realize that anytime you need the individual self, you just bring it forward. Anytime you need to meld or support or become one or, or listen to another, that you can do that. In order to have collective consciousness, you have to be able to focus your attention on someone else without the tag, without the anchor going, but what does that mean to me? But what does that mean to me? What effect will that have on me? If you are using cosmic energies and you extend your consciousness out to another person, and you're totally focused on that person, uh, that is when the merging can occur. You will not lose the self. Uh, but you can't break through the barrier uh, and as long as you're going, but what about me? But what about me? And this is why meditation is so important. It's why doing incarnational work is so important. To begin to uh, realize that life and death um, are, our, are just our illusions, just the permeability of bodies, of, of molecules, it has nothing to do with cosmic truth. Uh, but we're coming to that. We all know about it because we have uh, references from the level of the soul where there have been collective consciousness uh, as a part of our experience, as part of our soul experience. Perhaps not in what we would call a lifetime, but in the experience of the soul, uh, individually and collectively. So this is something that's necessary for us at this time. It's necessary to hear the heart of someone else uh, without saying, mm, is that true for me? What do I think about that? How am I involved? But actually listen to the other person. Uh, whether it's the brilliance of an idea or the pain of an emotion. And in that way we can begin to uh, move in and out of each other in safety and uh, in the evolutionary process. I'm wondering... Um Sometimes I, I notice myself like picking up on other people's fear and anxiety. And I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on how to block that or yes, how to work with that in a compassionate way where you don't feel that. Yes. That That's what I was talking about. The moment you can say, this is not mine. Oh, I'm contracting, but they're the ones that are angry or fearful or involved in something. Then... It's a simple law of energy. It just has to do with the direction of energy. If you extend energy out, you will expand. And if you expand, you will quicken. As you quicken, vibrate faster. Slow energies like fear and anger, they, they can't stick to you. So one of the things that we would always suggest would be these exercises in consciousness that have to do with extension of light. Uh, so for example, if you see someone and you can tell that they're suffering, then um, there are two ways to handle that. One would be focusing on that person. What color do they need from me? 
to come into balance and be released. And then always draw that color or colors from the cosmos down to the top of your head into your solar plexus, which is the seat of the emotional body. And then extend that beam of light to them. As you do that, what will happen is that you'll shake free. And so you, if, if you're extending the energy, the only energy that can come into you has to be equal to yours or higher or faster. And so uh, you don't even have to think about it. If you're doing this, you're not going to take it in. You, but you may be able to be compassionate. You may be able to see the source or, or relate to them in a way that you emotionally would not be able to do before. Uh, the other thing is when you feel as if, you know, uh, suddenly you feel tired or uh, you feel depressed, where am I holding that energy in my body? Again, speaking to your body. You might see the place or hear the place or feel the place in your body. Wherever that is, where am I holding that sadness, for example? And then bring your awareness into that place. And then what color does it need to be released? So that you're giving permission to your body to let go of something that you would otherwise karmically collect because you feel that's what you deserve or because you've agreed on a karmic spiritual level to take on the burden of somebody else because you abuse them, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so it's a very quick way of balancing karma so that we can go on. Karma is just cause and effect. It's just if you do this, that happens. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's good, bad, or neutral. It's just that if you breathe, a ripple goes out. You know, and that ripple will do something. Uh, and so we want to be able to orchestrate the laws of energy in ways that support everyone. As I said earlier, by taking on their fear or their emotions, you're not helping them. And if they feel that you are sympathetic to them, then they will feel justified at being victims. Uh, justified, I can't help it, it's the world doing it to me. And that does not help them to move past that and to discover that they have the strength and the intelligence to find an answer to it and to go on. Because after all, life is about going on. <laughs> yes. What else? You were mentioning the emotional body and the whispering that kind of sometimes takes us off of our real trap. You also talk about that we only use kind of a very small part of the emotional body. Could you talk about how we can access maybe more helpful parts of our emotional bodies? It's very, very simple. If you recognize that our emotions are just the emotional body emoting, expressing uh, vibrations that are in it, which again, may not even be belong to you. They're just emotional energies passing through. Usually we take on things that, that uh, are equal to something we have of our own. We mind us, we project. Uh, so the trick to that, to using a, a larger part of the emotional body, is to discover higher octaves of emotion. The emotional body will say, I like being fearful because then nobody can blame me. It's not my fault. You know, instead of, I like being visible and joyous because it's delicious. And so higher octaves of emotional energy uh, are available to us. It's amazing to me that often when I'm doing a consultation or in the sessions that we have, we say, for example, this is a classic one, go to a memory when you felt the love of your father. Oh, my father never loved me. <laughs> no, no, no. Go to memory when you felt this. No, he never loved me. We have pushed out a memory that could support us to see ourselves in a different way. Because uh, uh, we are enjoying not being loved by the Father because therefore it's not our fault. It's his fault. And this is a pattern that we all engage in. So if instead of that, again, if you were looking for that, you could find a moment might be just a look in the eye, it might be a whole, a long experience or a flicker in which that that you were seeking was available, that brought you into a higher octave. 
So with the emotional body, we need to discipline ourselves to say, what's the energy? And we're going to do this right now. So close your eyes, take a deep breath in your body, and ask your emotional body, what is the highest emotion that would serve you at this moment? Is it laughter? Is it love? Is it joyousness? Is it ecstasy? Just take the first one that comes to you. And whatever that is, just ask your emotional body to give you an energetic expression of that. It might be a little flutter, it might be a color, it might be a pulse, it might be a breath. Whatever that is, just breathe in that that represents that higher emotion at this moment that you identify. Just let that flow through your body. Just let it flow through you and then radiate it out from your body out into the world. Give that gift to the world. It's that easy. It's our choice. Great love and open your eyes. What'd you get? Um, I saw myself dancing. Uh -huh. And it was this, 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 this yellow white sparkling energy all around. It was Great. really beautiful. Great. So why would you choose anger and explosive mom instead of that? Yes? You have one minute. I have one minute? I thought you were telling me it was over. Oh. Somebody else, what did you get? What did you get, Bruce? I got a symphonic crescendo that in sound yes. that just represented sort of explosion, birthing, and um, coming forth into freedom and power for mm. everything. Fantastic. Mm. See, all of those senses that we have can, can give us infinite points of reference to higher emotional uh, energies that belong to us, that nourish us. So, um, if we can access all these these high frequencies, does that mean that we that we really know the whole thing of the emotional body? It's only that we only use a part of it. Yes, but knowing something <laughs> that's an illusion, <laughs> because there's always evolution. <laughs> okay. So, what is the ending and the beginning? Not so. It stretches with your capacity to imagine, to focus. And the more we go into those higher, the more we can go higher. That's right. Go and there's higher. no ceiling. Nice. <laughs> Blessings.